Welcome. <clears throat> Welcome to biomedical research. I am proud to call you colleagues and fellow students of the ICANN School of Medicine of Mount Sinai. This is my most important message to you. You belong here. You belong in graduate school, and I hope you're excited about this scientific adventure you are beginning. Science, especially important, groundbreaking science, is extremely difficult. In the next five to six years, you will feel overwhelmed, daunted, bored out of your gourd, frustrated, and likely question whether you made a mistake with your thesis project, your thesis advisor, your graduate program, even your favorite coffee order will be in question. <laughs> when this happens, and it will, remember you are not alone. This is perfectly normal and expected. All of your classmates will feel that way at some point. This is because a PhD thesis project is much more difficult than any of the most demanding classes you've ever taken as a student. My best friend and I met as undergraduates in our, first, um, in our second year organic chemistry class. I was supporting myself through undergrad studies, working as a laboratory technician, and I knew very early on that I wanted to be a biomedical researcher running a research lab. In our senior year, my friend surprised me by applying and joining the physical chemistry PhD program at University of Washington. I was surprised because she had never undertaken a research project. I asked her if she was sure this was really the right decision for her. She assured me that she loved physical chemistry, that she loved the classes. After a few years, she took a master's and left the program despite one of her experiments being successfully performed on the space shuttle. She told me, research wasn't what I expected. My favorite part of PCAM was doing the really tough problems and then looking in the back of the book to see that I was right. Research didn't give me that kind of validation. And this was a clarifying moment for me. In research, we, the scientists, are writing the back of the book. We have to live with the knowledge that we could be wrong, that our approach may not work, that we may not be asking the right questions, or that our research could be fundamentally flawed because of an underlying assumption is incorrect. In short, doing research makes you feel stupid. <laughs> the more you know about your research project, the more you realize how much we don't understand. You must accept this. And when you do, it's liberating rather than demoralizing. Martin Schwartz wrote a superb perspective in the Journal of Cell, Bio and Cell Science entitled The Importance of Stupidity in Scientific Research. A key premise is that it is important for PhD students to appreciate how difficult research is, that you will feel stupid at times, but you need to be productively stupid. Embrace it and realize that if you don't feel that way, you aren't working hard enough or you're not pushing the boundaries of our knowledge enough. Of course, that doesn't mean you have to do it alone. One of the most important decisions that you will be making in the next year is to choose your research mentor and laboratory. I'm super glad that, that, that Dr. Nessler actually talked about this already. Choose your mentor wisely. A great PhD mentor is frankly more important than research topic or project. There are so, so many great questions in research. Please do not limit yourself to what intrigued you before you entered graduate school. Be open-minded about projects and seek out a terrific mentor. Such a mentor will be a great and enthusiastic scientist. They will ask important questions about biology and make advances that are both mechanistic and conceptual. How will you know this? Read, read, and read some more. I cannot stress enough how easy it is to distinguish yourself as an exceptional scientist simply by being well-read. But also, a great mentor reveals in mentoring, it revels in mentoring trainees and, and finds the mentoring process itself tremendously rewarding. This kind of mentor will guide and advise you while nurturing your path to independence. Your task with the help of your mentor in the next five to six years is to learn how to identify critical research questions and design means to answer them. Once you have data, you will need to learn to interpret it, 
but also how to communicate those interpretations and, and your findings uh, to the general community and to other fellow scientists. A great mentor will support you by sending you to scientific conferences and courses and introducing you to fellow scientists and your work to fellow scientists. Take advantage of your rotations to speak candidly with current and former lab members and students and postdocs in the neighboring labs. They will be honest about the experience and the laboratory environment. Are the trainees generally happy in the lab? Are lab meetings a group discussion? Do the trainees get support in preparing seminars and poster presentations? Is there a team spirit in the lab or is it too competitive? Listen to them. Do not assume that you are a magical unicorn that will have a different experience from everyone else. <laughs> then, and this is really key, the key component to a successful mentor-mentee match is self-analysis. What is the best research and training environment for you? What are your shortcomings and the best ways to mitigate them? Do you need frequent meetings to keep you on task or do you resent them? Also, remember, life happens when you're in graduate school and you need a strong advocate both for when things are going poorly, personally and professionally, and when you're thriving. Seek that special person and they will set you up for life as a research scientist. I am very fortunate in my choice of Rob Krauss as my PhD mentor. He is a rigorous and brilliant scientist who also has a happy family life. Such traits are highly worth emulating. But I was also reminded very recently of how gracious Rob was in my last year of my PhD when I was a pretty cranky and frankly, <clears throat> a bit arrogant graduate student. And there was a bit of karma when my first graduate student was walking down the, uh, and, and accepted her thesis this last spring. Besides your mentor and lab mates, you also have each other. Friends you make in graduate school can be supporters and inspirations for you and your work for life, even if you end up following different paths and subjects. I just spent the weekend in Munich, actually Labor Day weekend in Munich, with two of my beloved graduate colleagues from Mount Sinai, and I count them among my most treasured advisors. One is in the top administration of the Max Planck Institute, and the other is an editor of a major journal. The different perspectives of our career choices, coupled with our common research experience at Mount Sinai, is a rich source of self-reflection and empowerment. We often discuss difficult career, work, and mentoring issues in depth, and we'll even role play with each other, difficult conversations that we might be having with mentees or when asking for money or support for our research projects. I encourage you to get to know all of your classmates but even more importantly, to support each other. What do I mean? Emily Bernhardt wrote a terrific perspective for Nature in 2017 that centers on an anonymous quote given as, a, as advice to newly entering graduate biology students. Everyone here is smart. Distinguish yourself by being kind. You are a diverse and powerful group of scientists. The school cares about your views, particularly collectively. You have an opportunity to develop a supportive group gestalt that embraces your diversity and, powers, and empowers you all. The eminent evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould said, we pass through this world but once. Few tragedies can be more extensive than the stunting of life. Few injustices deeper than the denial of an opportunity to strive, to even hope, by a limit imposed from without, but falsely identified as lying within. You have the opportunity to create an inclusive graduate experience for all of you. Inclusion is necessary to support a diverse population of scientists and is the key to creating an environment that supports the highest level of innovation. Biomedicine needs all the brilliant minds. Do not perpetuate the status quo that is preventing underrepresented individuals from striving and succeeding. How to go about doing that is you are just, you know, first year graduate students. Listen to each other. Support each other's work and research rigorously, but kindly. Allow time for the quieter and more introspective students to voice themselves in group discussions. Invite and encourage the invitation of diverse speakers. 
Don't tolerate condescension from faculty or from each other. A simple wow and pause after someone says something intolerant or condescending can be a powerful way to acknowledge negative comments and adjust bad behavior. Finally, please try not to continuously compare yourself to everyone else. Research is a long journey and prizes and awards are not enough to sustain you. This builds resentment and fosters imposter syndrome, which is the feeling that you don't belong. And as I stated in the beginning, it is abundantly clear that you all belong here. So welcome to biomedical research and let's make beautiful science together. Thank you.